wait for 10 o'clock. But then uh, we have these announcements that I'm going to do with okay. And then we'll follow up here. Um, let's see. After the assurance of pardon, and I will talk about this, and then as soon as we go to the it's you. Good morning. It is nice to see people populating the pews. <laughs> Welcome everyone to worship today, both in the sanctuary and online. There are several announcements this morning, so please bear with me. First of all, we have the fellowship pads. Please be sure to uh, sign in. And for those visitors, please give us your information and if you do see a visitor, please welcome them and uh, show that we are a welcoming community church. There is a note for missions about the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. The Mission and Benevolence Committee will be matching funds up to $1,000 for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to support hurricane and wildlife, uh, wildfire relief. To donate to this fund, please make your checks out to Skittleway Community Church, but in the memo line, put for disaster assistance, please. Now, I have an announcement, or Ellen has an announcement to make. Hello, yes. Hello everyone, if you haven't met me yet, my name is Ellen Barney Castle. I am your transitional music director and in two weeks and two days on October 5th, we'll have our first choir rehearsal. I'm really, really excited. Directing a choir is one of my personal passions. I love to do it. I keep getting questions from a lot of you. Where is this choir going to come from? Look around you, you're it. I hear you every Sunday singing beautifully, and even if you don't think you sound beautiful, I think you do. So please, please come October 5th, 7 o'clock, all skill levels welcome, um, and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Next week, there is going to be a congregational meeting immediately following the worship. The purpose of the meeting to hear a report from the pastor nominating committee, to vote on the committee's recommendation for a full-time pastor. We also want to welcome Reverend John Rule. He is an ordained PCUSA teaching elder who works as the outreach coordinator for Union Mission of Savannah. He is a graduate of Columbia Theological Seminary and will begin work on his Doctor of Ministry degree this summer through Drew University, focusing on spirituality and pilgrimage. John is married to Reverend Chrissy Rule, who is a minister of children and families at the Isle of Hope, UMC. They have a daughter, Remy, who is eight, and a son, Ethan, six years old. They live on the Isle of Hope and enjoy sports, camping, and being outdoors. So welcome, John. This is the call to worship. Happy are those who follow the ways of the Lord. God's ways are just and merciful. Those who follow God's ways are continually nourished in faith. 
In all that they do, they prosper. Come, let us open our hearts to God's compassionate love. Let us celebrate God's mercy and justice. Let us worship God. Please remain standing for the opening prayer. Great triune God, we have gathered here in your name as an act of faith, believing that you are not always among us, but that you love us. It is often hard to recognize your love, see your mercy, and feel your presence. Help us today in our worship that we might be transparent in your grace as you reveal yourself to each one of us and empower us to serve you. Amen. May be seated. In our call to confession, Jesus said, whoever wants to be the first must be the last of all and servant to all. Let us humble ourselves before God and confess our sins. Holy God, we commit ourselves to service, but fail to have a servant's heart. We seek social status, but not sacrifice. We welcome worldly success, but the humble path of Christ. 
Forgive us, we pray. Free us from the pressures of the world that keep us jockeying for position. Help us to be servants of all. Amen. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now for a little business. And this is about our offering. As God's people, we thank God for all God is and does for us. In response to God's goodness, we give the gifts of our lives in gratitude. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for the blessings you have given us year after year. Help us to wisely use the time, talents, gifts, and lives you have given us. Lead us, Lord, and use all we offer as we seek to serve you through by serving all around us. Amen. And now I'm going to turn it over to Reverend Roll. As we continue in this time of worship, let us pause in these moments and pray once more. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and eternal God, we give you thanks for this day, for a day we've not seen before, and for what our gathering represents in our faith. For we gather on Sunday because this is the day of resurrection. We gather on this day to align our steps with those who've come before us and to align our steps with our leader, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the creation of all things, your Holy Spirit hovered over the chaos to call something new into being. And so, O oh Holy Spirit, draw near to us in our chaos. Help us to know your presence alongside us and breathe your life into our lungs. Open now our ears and our hearts and our minds to the power of your living word. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Listen now for the word of the Lord in the reading of Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And again, let us listen for the word of the Lord in the reading of Mark chapter 9, verses, not, verses 30 through 37.
they went on from there and passed through Galilee. He didn't want anyone to know it. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days later, after being killed, he will rise again. But they didn't understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and he was in the house, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down and called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them and taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, you've got to love the disciples here. They really just don't get it. It's so relatable, so human. By chapter 9 in Mark's Gospel, the Lord has announced as a religious and cultural successor to John the Baptist. He's begun his public ministry by pronouncing that in the face of the Roman occupiers. He's brought the true God's kingdom near. He's demonstrated <clears throat> supernatural abilities to bring healing and social reconciliation to the ritually unclean. He's challenged the status quo of the corrupt religious institution of his time. He's appointed 12 from the growing crowds of followers as his closest disciples, the same number as the original tribes of Israel. Jesus has taught with power and authority across the countryside and beyond the boundaries of the covenant community and has even demonstrated an ability to somehow influence the natural elements by calming a storm and by feeding 5,000 with a two-piece fish meal. If I were in power in the Roman Empire, I'd have my eye on this guy. If I were one of the re religious elites, I'd be concerned about the crowds that he's gathering and what might happen if he pushes them to push back on the occupiers. And probably, I guess, if I was one of the 12 who had been chosen to be his closest disciples, I might be right there with them, speculating about my place of authority or service when the kingdom of Jesus indeed comes to pass. It's understandable on a human level. The perceptions, even the projections of some of the ones who walked alongside the historical Jesus. They were that this man was primed to do something politically, culturally, and even geographically big. That's what messiahs were understood to be about. And in some ways, we still want Jesus to be there. We still want Jesus to rubber stamp our own social and political aspirations. 
But the Jesus of the Gospels is problematic to that viewpoint. The Jesus of the Gospels tosses off the harnesses that we seek to try to place on him. He's not that kind of horse. Jesus cannot be saddled with something so worldly oriented like that. Humanity has certainly tried throughout the years to justify our own personal political preferences with a Jesus that fits in those places. But again and again, he rebukes those attempts. He turns it on its head. And often we're left with a welt on our rear end and an insatiable desire to mount up in faith again somehow. Over the course of the last few weeks in the lectionary, Jesus quite plainly lays out the way to mount up with him in faith. Beginning in chapter 8, he tells his disciples that following him leads to things like suffering and rejection and even death. And then on the other side of that, something mysterious and yet not yet known in the rising to new life. At at first hearing this, Peter tells Jesus to shut up. He rebukes the Lord to his face. And Jesus turns it back on Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he says. For you are setting your view on, on things that are not divine, but things that are human. Just verses before all this, Peter was the first one to confess that Jesus was the Messiah. And now, minutes later, Jesus is calling him Satan's mouthpiece. I wonder how we would hear it if Jesus' rebuke came to us. I wonder how the rebuke of Christ would land in today's discourse in the public square. I wonder who in this room would still follow Christ if he leveled such a charge against us. But it is clear that Jesus is not motivated by politics. It's clear that he's not a celebrity or an influencer. No, Jesus rises above such things even though he certainly has some things to speak into those places. There's something deeper, something more true, something more essential about where Jesus is coming from, even than our politics. Can you imagine that? Jesus is deeper deeper rooted than things social or things economical or things educational or things legal. Jesus goes deeper than all of that. And perhaps that's why it's so difficult for us to pin him down. We tend to engage Jesus on terms that we believe are most essential to us while he is drawing for thing, from things that are deeper. There's a deeper disharmony, disharmony that affects our human condition. And if you want to engage it, if you want to access it, if you want to approach Jesus, you're going to have to rid yourself of all those other things first. We're going to have to seek to know Jesus at the point of his reality. We're going to have to make space for Jesus to meet us. And we're going to have to be open to be planted where he is planted. In today's scripture, Jesus speaks one of the most beloved, simple, yet profound challenges to the social order of his day. 
In the world, we work by promoting the ones we perceive to be best qualified. In, some, many, in many instances, this means questions like, where are you from? Where did you go to school? Who or what kind of people would speak well of you? These type of things are the prescriptive formula for advancing the places of power in the world as it is. And that's not very different from Jesus' time. In those times, it wasn't as much about being able to tout your qualifications while knowing the right kinds of people. In those times, it was about honor and shame. If your great-grandfather was a fisherman, that's what you were going to be. If your great-grandfather was a carpenter, that's what you were going to be too. The only way to know which, what kind of fisherman or carpenter your family would be is if you proved to be perceived to have honor. If something in your family caused cultural shame, like, say, being born out of wedlock, the legacy of shame would follow you and would be carried over to the next generation as well. And of course, all of this rested on men of the time, right? Women in biblical times were viewed as property. And children? Children, well, they weren't really even considered to be fully human. But then one day, as Jesus was correcting and reorienting his disciples about how to live a life of honor in Christ's way of faith, Jesus cast his attention and everybody in the room's attention to one of the children running through the room. The Lord acknowledged the child's presence, not even a child that he was related to. And he put the child in center stage. Scripture tells us that he held the child in his own arms. And while he embraced this child, he said, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name also welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me doesn't just welcome me, but the one who sent me. So what's the message here? It's the message directed at a group of disciples who had just been leveraging themselves for positions of power in Christ's movement. It's a message to a world who is prone to promote and celebrate a certain kind of power. It's a message to us, to you and to me. As we try to navigate faith in this weird pandemic world in a denomination that was spiraling downward before COVID. And what does it say? It says to take notice. To take notice of the ones who aren't usually even considered to be part of the conversation of faith and of life. It's a message that pushes us to recognize that making space for them, being hospitable to them, being curious about them, being open to them, Welcoming others means welcoming Christ. And as Jesus says for himself, being open to Christ means being open to the one who sent him. Sisters and brothers, we are in a difficult spot these days. Things have been hard. Some things have accelerated. Some things have gotten heated. 
Some things we've invested ourselves have fallen flat. Some things we believed in showed themselves to be more dangerous than we could have imagined. If you're feeling pressed, if you feel like you're running in every direction but not getting anywhere, if you feel overwhelmed and underprepared, it's okay. These are those type of times. We've been enduring a crisis. But if today's lectionary reminds us of anything, it's that Jesus has access, Jesus is tapped into something deeper than the ways and the effects of a broken world. And if we just take some time, if we just carve out some space to look for him, to wait for him, to meet him where he is. We'll find him waiting for us there too. Maybe it's time to get back to some of the basics. Maybe it's time to return to a place where we evaluate the implications of confessing something like Jesus is Lord. Maybe it's time to put first things first again and let everything else fall in line behind that. Can we do that? Can we get back to a place like that? Can we stop putting the cart before the horse and allow the Lord Jesus to lead us and to teach us and to shape us Can we be rooted in divine things? Are we willing and able to allow for the re readjustments that something like that might take? For example, if we say that Jesus is Lord, then a candidate for office is not. If we say Jesus is Lord, then my preference for source of news and cultural things is not. If Jesus is Lord, then everything I might have propped up to make myself feel like I'm righteous is not. If Jesus is Lord, then I've got to make room for people I've never cons considered worth my time to have a voice. If Jesus is Lord, then it's not about me and mine. If Jesus is Lord, my awareness of the world and how I value others has to expand. And when we get to a place like that, when we silence the voices within ourselves that push us to self-promotion, displacing others in our path, we make some room. We make room for the divinity of others. And that's when we begin to understand just how close God's kingdom is. Thankfully, there's a word in Christian grammar that points us to that place. In Greek, it's called metanoia, which means to change our knowing. But it's been translated as repent. And so, sisters and brothers, let us repent. Let us change how we know. Let us do the work of shifting from a mindset of worldly things 
and plant our feet firmly on divine things. For in a world as often volatile and menacing as ours is, there's nothing more solid. There's nothing more sure to be rooted in than a confession like Jesus is Lord. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so in response to the word read and proclaimed, let us stand together and unify our voices with those who've come before us. Let us say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing our final hymn together, hymn number 353, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Jesus. 